Uh, good evening and welcome to the British School and to the fifth of this year's lectures accompanying our annual master's course in the topography and archaeology of the City of Rome. Our speaker tonight is a practicing architect whose great knowledge of ancient construction technique has lent enormous value and conviction to his study of Roman and Byzantine architecture. Paolo Viti, uh, who is half Greek, studied for his PhD at the University of Thessalonica and his thesis on vaulted construction in the Peloponnese after the Roman conquest was awarded the prestigious Grand Prix for research on cultural heritage by the European Union and it's just been published as a monograph uh, Building Roman Greece Innovation in Vaulted Construction in the Peloponnese in our library now. His recent work on the Mausoleum of Hadrian has revolutionized not only what we know of that emperor's funerary ideology, but also revealed extensive material remains of the iconic monument which were hitherto unknown. In addition to holding research posts at uh, Roma Tre, La Sapienza, and the Scuola Archaeologica Italiana di Atena, Paolo has directed restoration work on ancient Byzantine and Roman and Baroque buildings in such important and diverse places as Rome, Pompeii, Paestum, Ancona, Nicosia, and Lemnos. The work we hear about tonight couldn't come at a better moment for participants of our MA course, since just this morning uh, we were exploring the audacious vaulting of Riberius's Domus Agustana, and on Saturday we'll be in the Domus Aurea prior to uh, reaching the Aurelianic walls in the next few weeks. And for the benefit of our students, Paolo has very kindly agreed to relate his research in what is his fifth language, English, uh, in a lecture entitled Choosing the Right Vaulting uh, in the Building Program of Honoris and Justinian for the Aurelianic Walls. Would you please welcome Paolo Viti. Thank you very much, Robert, and I'm very pleased to be here for the series of City of Rome conferences. Uh, well, this is the first time I give a lecture here was three years ago. It was the first time I uh, tried to talk in English in, uh, with a British and English audience. So today I'm much more relaxed, maybe, for, uh, than the first time. Um, the topic today will be uh, based on a study I made um, three or four years ago, uh, based on one observation by Lucas Koza, who made a seminal work on, on the Aurelianic walls, uh, uh, and particularly in uh, 1987, uh, in an article uh, titled Observa uh, Osservazioni sulle mura Aureliane a Roma, he made uh, uh, some, uh, a very brief uh, look to uh, some vaulting systems, and I was much impressed by the fact that uh, he mentioned a very peculiar uh, brick vault, uh, which is rather uncommon in, uh, in Rome. So, beginning from this, I decided uh, to go uh, in depth into the understanding of this uh, very peculiar vault, and the result is uh, today's presentation. Um, uh, the, my, uh, let me see, supposedly, so I guess, yes, uh, my, uh, uh, I will make a very brief introduction on what is a concrete vault, just to understand, uh, which is the horizon of uh, con vaulting construction in Rome. Uh, then uh, 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 just the understanding of this very demanding project that was the Relianic Walls, how uh, vaulting helped to the aims of uh, the project. Um, and by uh, a matter of fact, the vaults were very, very important uh, for functional uh, purposes, of course. Uh, then we uh, go to the brick vaults, which is something that is uh, uh, a very uh, peculiar building technique that is very common in the East. And for that reason, uh, I will continue focusing on the brick vaults in the Justinian period. And to end, uh, with uh, uh, the understanding of a possible intervention 
uh, just along the Gothic Wars when uh, Justinian uh, and his generals were uh, fighting against the uh, Gothic uh, um, kings in Italy. Uh, so, beginning with concrete vaults, uh, well, this is just to understand the splendor of Roman concrete. Uh, it's, uh, we have here some examples. Of course, in some cases, uh, we can find uh, the very traditional uh, ashlar construction made of uh, stone voussoirs, but the most common uh, uh, technique used in uh, Roman times, in imperial times, is of course uh, Roman concrete, and uh, we have amazing examples of this uh, building technique in Rome, of course, uh, uh, with few parallels in uh, the rest of the empire, uh, possibly uh, for uh, the uh, fact that here in Rome we have major uh, building programs by the emperors. Uh, of course, uh, the Pantheon has a leading role in, uh, in uh, uh, developing this uh, building technique, and the difference uh, with uh, the very traditional technique made of uh, st uh, stone construction, that is to say with the ashlar construction, is that for, uh, 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 for having a stone uh, vault made of voussoirs, you need, of course, a centering, uh, and then you go placing the stone voussoirs up to the top, and at the very end you put the keystone, when the keystone enters, it pushes towards the other uh, voussoirs and then releases the weight up to the supports. Uh, on a, in the case of a Roman uh, concrete uh, vault, you also need to have a centering. Uh, here in uh, imperial vaulting, uh, you have a layering made of horizontal Stones, uh, stones, made, uh, let's just say, stones placed in horizontal layers, which is very typical in Roman concrete. Uh, once the uh, the this uh, the concrete has hardened, this it is possible to remove the centering, and then the the vault releases the weight on the supports. So it is absolutely necessary to have uh, a centering in both of the construction systems. Uh, of course, uh, what comes out uh, from, uh, from a Roman concrete vault is a very a massive uh, uh, structure, uh, which we could consider like a monolite, uh, uh, making a one piece, not with voussoirs like in the other system. Uh, the idea, of course, is to have, uh, instead of having heavy and big voussoirs to create an arch with uh, limited possibilities to uh, enlarge the span between the supports, in Roman concrete what you have is exactly the possibility to use very small pieces to make big constructions as the Pantheon. Uh, of course, the technical resources in Rome uh, are made of uh, the local uh, materials, and namely, we have to mention the pozzolana, which has a very important role in developing the hydraulic mortar. And uh, uh, last thing is about uh, the constraints of uh, vaulting construction, which is the centering. The centering is a very demanding part of the building process because it needs, of course, a lot of time and a lot of, of course, uh, financial, uh, it increases the financial, the cost of, of the construction. Uh, the technical difficulties in uh, any uh, vaulted construction comes out, of course, from the fact that it develops a thrust. The thrust is, uh, of course, a major problem for the stability of the buildings. This was just a very brief introduction just to understand what is a concrete vault. Then let's go to the uh, Aurelianic uh, project. Uh, as you know, the Relianic project is an immense uh, construction. 
if we uh, hypothetically we can calculate that all the length, including the part uh, in uh, around Trastevere, is around 18 kilometers. And uh, in these 18 kilometers, we can calculate more or less 250 towers. So it's a very imposing uh, project, uh, which of course had uh, uh, many, uh, many problems. I'm not going to enter into detail about uh, the project itself, and I would like rather to concentrate uh, my talk on the fact that uh, from the first phase, from Aurelian, to the second phase, uh, the two phases uh, were al already uh, very uh, clearly stated in uh, Luco Scott's uh, 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 article, which I mentioned earlier. And the fact is uh, that uh, if we consider the, this part that is supposedly the uh, Aurelianic wall, which was six meters high. Of course, I am considering one of the sectors of uh, the Aurelianic walls. There are, of course, differences within all the length of the Aurelianic walls. If we consider uh, in uh, the sector named L, uh, uh, which is the one you see on the left image, uh, uh, it is very interesting because there is a kind of crack in the middle, this crack doesn't continue on the, uh, on the arches, on the above arches, and this uh, makes possible to suggest that this is not really a crack, but is the contact point between the two phases. The first phase, the one from Aurelian, and then the addition made under Honorius. Uh, based on this, we can more roughly calculate the uh, how much demanding was uh, the, also the project made by Honorius, uh, who uh, rises the height of the, uh, of the walls up to 12 meters. And as you can see here, the, the figures, they just point out if we could calculate a gross volume from this, uh, from the Aurelian phase of around 316 cubic meters for, uh, for the stretch that goes from one tower to the other. These stretches are long 100 feet, that is to say 30 meters. So in this stretch we can calculate for the Aurelianic project we had around 300 uh, cubic meters, which in the case of uh, the project made by Honorius, uh, this rises, let's say, in a gross volume, 900 uh, cubic meters, but less 160 cubic meters, which is exactly the amount, the volume uh, of voids that are created within the lower uh, part of the walls. We have two uh, 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 passages, passway, uh, walkways, one, the upper one, and then the lower one. The lower one is at the same height as uh, the uh, original uh, uh, walkway in the, Aureliani, uh, the Aurelian uh, phase. And what we see is that uh, these voids, they develop 160 cubic meters. In uh, this, the reason for this is clearly functional because it, it makes these voids make possible uh, to walk along uh, the, the lower level. Nevertheless, their contribution to decrease the amount of masonry needed for the construction is considerable. Uh, looking at the front of uh, of the of the wall, there is one uh, in one uh, stretch of the walls. Uh, there is a possibility, is maybe is the, uh, one of the few ones, there is uh, the possibility to distinguish uh, the, uh, the two faces. And it's exactly what she is looking at. She sees that there is indeed uh, the, the possibility to, uh, that the original crenellations 
were uh, preserved in uh, the elevation of the wall. This is not exactly uh, the original height. This, uh, it was much higher. However, here a detail shows very clearly that the two masonries, the facing of the two masonries is very similar in the two phases. Uh, nevertheless, here we see, we distinguish clearly uh, uh, this is the line of the, uh, of the walkway. Uh, you can also distinguish that you have the put log holes, that is to say the holes left by the uh, logs placed for the scaffolding, for the construction, which are not visible in the, uh, in the earlier phase. And uh, you have also the uh, loopholes uh, for the archers, uh, which uh, uh, are a very typical element of the uh, uh, Honorian phase. Uh, looking at, uh, at the section and the plan and the sections, uh, this plan shows the stretch between two towers around 30 meters. Uh, the system, as you can see, is that you have piers that support the upper walkway and they create these, uh, these areas uh, which are also used for the archers. The, every uh, archer has uh, a, a niche uh, corresponding to a loophole and uh, the system is very functional. So you can walk from one tower to the other and uh, you have also the space for the archers. In terms of construction, so, and of vaulting, of course, uh, what we have is, uh, first of all, we have the barrel vaults A uh, that support the upper walkway. Uh, these uh, uh, are the larger uh, uh, vaults. Then we have smaller ones, which are the ones you see here, B, uh, which are the ones that go along the gallery. So they make the cover the walkway uh, between uh, the lower walkway between one tower and the other. And C are the niches above the loopholes, which are the one you see here. Uh, all these uh, elements are built according to the uh, building technique uh, used in Rome, which is not exactly Roman concrete, uh, but is, we can say, mortar rubble, distinguishing that Roman concrete has this exact layering in horizontal courses, which I mentioned earlier, which doesn't uh, really exist in this case. If we, uh, there is a stretch here, uh, 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 this is very close to Porta Latina, which is quite interesting because each time we find a part that has collapsed, we can see, uh, we can make an anatomy of the construction and understand building details which are very useful for uh, looking at the construction techniques and solutions. First of all, what we see here is uh, we have uh, some kind of uh, the impost of the vault. We have always a kind of recesses, very important. This recess is used for placing the centering. In this case, what we say uh, is that uh, if uh, I go just back one minute, you see here a, s a proposed centering with the formwork. Centering is the old system. The formwork is, are the boards that give the form to the bolt. Uh, as you can see, in this case, this is called a flying centering. That is to say that it is it doesn't is not supported by the floor but it's, it's supported by an element, a protruding element, or sometimes by a wooden beam. Uh, so we have these recesses here, that is to say in this position and here, 
And we have also another recess, we will see it later quite uh, better than in this drawing. This is where the, uh, the boards of the uh, formwork are placed on top of the wall. So they just build the wall and they place the, is used like support for the, for, for the, uh, for the timber boards. And uh, then we have this rubble masonry with mortar rubble here. And we distinguish clearly that there are different sectors. There is a lower part. This is very, very irregular. So we have, in this case, we are just looking at a detail here. We have marble, tuff, and bricks, which explains exactly the concept of the construction, reusing materials as much as possible. There is, of course, a, an amount of material uh, that is new, uh, is uh, quarried expressively for the construction, as for example, we can imagine the pozzolana for the, for, uh, for the mortar. Uh, uh, but uh, the, since the huge amount of uh, material needed for this enormous construction, there is a lot of material that is reused. So we, it is likely that we find a lot of material and we clearly understand that the, the masons, they are just going ahead uh, depending on the material that they are getting. So if we have a very sector in this case that is made with marble, tuff and bricks, we have in another very close by sector other materials. We have peperino, uh, tuff and bricks. And if we go up, we find, uh, we find uh, more bigger stones so uh, much quicker work. Sometimes these stones are not placed exactly horizontal like in the Roman tradition of concrete, but they are placed rather radially. So the whole construction shows not to be uh, so uh, strictly, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, very strictly uh, controlled by uh, the architects. The masons are working kind of freely to go very quick with the construction. Uh, if we go to, uh, to the towers, uh, the towers uh, have a lower chamber. You see here the lower chamber. In the lower chamber, uh, the system uh, again uses, ma has many volts. Uh, one volt uh, is the one covering the chamber the, in this part. Uh, you see it here is a barrel vault, uh, very similar to the one uh, in the gallery. Uh, then there are uh, other barrel vaults uh, having the same span, uh, which are needed to support the staircase. The staircase, as you can see, goes here, then turns and go up here goes here and then go up. So these vaults they needed, are needed to support the, uh, the, the staircase, uh, which have, as you see, the same span as the one of the gallery. Uh, and then we have smaller vaults, which are the ones that cover the, uh, the staircase, which are exactly the same span as the one we have in the gallery. So let's say the masons or the architects have decided to use two uh, dimensions for, for the vaults. The one, a small one, around 120 centimeters, and uh, another one which is uh, a, a little bit bigger. Uh, they are all small vaults, uh, if we are, let's say, medium-sized vaults, if we look at, uh, of course, more monumental construction. Here is the case of uh, one uh, looking into the lower chamber of one tower, and here we can see the imprints left by the boards for the, of the formwork. And here, at the very end, you see here is the, uh, we have uh, this recess where the, the boards were placed into. So they were just filled there. 
and, uh, and in the front, this mass of uh, material, mortar material, has the, the very, very traditional uh, brick arch. So this is the use of brick in uh, a Roman construction. The brick is used only for the facing of arches and, of course, the facing of the walls. It's not used entirely for the construction of the vault. Uh, if we go uh, into further details, which are useful for the understanding of the building process, uh, and we get, for instance, this, uh, the vault, a barrel vault covering the, the gallery. Here we can see uh, the recess, which is created through a cornice, a brick cornice. Then you have here, clearly you can see there was a timber beam and uh, which was placed over the cornice and then you have the, uh, on the, uh, you have the timber boards, very, very regular uh, boards to create the vault. How we can understand this? We understand uh, these details through the observation of the imprints left by the boards on the concrete that was poured upon uh, to create the vault. So these uh, details show clearly this solution in this case. In other uh, places, because it's not at all uniform, it has an enormous variety of solutions which should be studied. I studied only a very small stretch of uh, uh, in, this, uh, in uh, one area between Porta Metronia and Porta Latina, but there could be much more uh, uh, different cases. What is in, in very interesting that we see that Masons, which are very uh, skilled and experienced, they just create the solution, the right solution for uh, every vault depending on the material they have and their skills, and of course the aim is to go uh, very quickly. In this case, in, uh, we have reused boards. It's not regular like this. Uh, the imprints are very regular, you can see it here. And we have in this case, in uh, Tower K11, we have the remains of a wooden tin, uh, board. Uh, other Solutions, very, very peculiar. Uh, uh, hardly you can find such solutions in uh, other parts of the city of Rome. So, very interesting. In this case, uh, uh, we have the, the same uh, wall to support the centering, but when we go and look to the intrados of this barrel vault, we find something that is very, very special. This is very chaotic, it's not common, it's just, a, we could say, a disaster. Um, what we clearly understand, but if we go to the facing, that they have used a very peculiar system with making, using timber boards to make some kind of gable structure uh, on which they have uh, created a masonry which has virtually the form of an arch, but is not an arch. Uh, we also see in this case uh, that the first sector of the vault was built without any, uh, uh, without any support. This is very typical. Up to the so-called haunches, that is to say, up to the level where the material can be set without sliding down, up to this level, you don't use a centering. So you can clearly see that. This is uh, the proposed reconstruction of uh, the solution. Uh, this is the arch. Uh, at the very front, you see that the bricks are placed uh, inclined over, over this. But then you have the form of the arch, which is used to give the facing, the very traditional facing of an arch. But Clearly, what has the vault is not has not the form of an arch. Other uh, elements of this construction is they are here. These are 
uh, two windows uh, of uh, uh, a tower, the windows facing the, the city, uh, again we find the same uh, system. I don't know if uh, this very peculiar uh, construction technique for the centering is used in other stretches of the Aurelianic walls. Uh, here between Porta Metronia and Porta Latina is used at least in uh, uh, six or seven cases. Uh, another very, very uh, uh, peculiar uh, so solutions can, can be found in the arches niches. Here uh, we have many possible solutions. The very traditional mortar rubble uh, which is the one you can see here. The facing of the arch is absolutely very clean, very well done. Look the joints, how they are very well uh, worked. But then if we go to the intradose of the niche, we find something that is much more chaotic. Uh, uh, this uh, is uh, uh, one uh, other solution. In this case, they are using only bricks, uh, instead that is to say the facing of, uh, of this uh, niche is made with, uh, uh, with bricks. Uh, so uh, we have two systems, the system uh, with mortar rubble and the system with bricks for the, for the intradose. And then we have something absolutely peculiar is this case. We have bricks here in the lower part, and a kind of very rough mortar rubble in the lower part. Uh, the understanding, uh, this part here, the understanding of this, at least my understanding, unless there is uh, any other proposal, uh, is uh, here that they have used uh, a very uh, peculiar system. They have built the first sector with the traditional brick facing, without support of centering, and then coming to the very top of the niche, which is the part that needs the centering, here the centering is, you see, it's very rough. The fact that it's very rough shows that uh, they created the form of the niche, putting, um, uh, placing some soil, some earth, as to form the, the, the niche. Uh, so uh, you have to imagine that here in the front it was closed with boards. They placed these horizontal boards here. These horizontal boards you see here, there are these elements that uh, give the suggestion that these boards were supported with these uh, posts placed there. And, and then they uh, just uh, created the vault above this. When they removed all the provisional part, remained this very special and very not uh, functional, but not nice at all. Uh, then we go up to the tower. For the tower, there is one of uh, the most interesting uh, details, construction details, is uh, the use of uh, the where the square form of, uh, of the tower uh, has at the corners these elements that architecturally are called squinches. These uh, squinches are necessary. Uh, they just reduce, as we can see, they reduce uh, the vault which is a pavilion vault, it has not the very, uh, like a dome, it's not a dome, it, the, the elements are straight. Uh, Lucas Scotza mentions the use of terracotta pots, uh, at least found in the lower part, to probably not really decrease the weight here, but for some reason to decrease the volume of masonry. Uh, this is uh, a restored view of the squinches, and the squinches again show that the masons were working uh, to, uh, to find solutions to speed 
uh, the construction. Uh, in this case, we are in the tower K1. Uh, what we can see, uh, uh, number four is a marble slab that is placed in the corner. Above the marble slab is a travertine corbel. We have another here and another here. Uh, so we have three travertine corbels, which make no sense uh, for uh, architecturally, but are very meaningful for the understanding of the construction process. Uh, again, we also see used the mortar rubble, uh, which uh, is made with tuff, and uh, there are remains of the mortar uh, that was placed above the centering. So what we understand it is likely that here we, uh, we had uh, these elements that were used to support uh, the centering. Uh, they created, a, uh, since the vault has this form, and the wall has this form. These elements created an el uh, the support through timber elements to make the squinch, which is the need to create squinches. Because the squinches, as you understand from this detail, make the construction rather more difficult. We could have, they are very small, uh, relatively small, uh, compared to the, uh, to the width of the chamber, and maybe they, uh, they could be considered unuseful for the aim of the construction. Uh, here, my understanding is uh, that the squinches reduce uh, the, each element of the pavilion in order that we can create a flying centering without having to support the whole vault up down to the lower floor of the chamber. And in this way, uh, having this reduced surface, which can be held with this post, uh, which of, in my interpretation, they are uh, placed to, uh, on the travertine corbels, all the system uh, becomes more logical in terms of speeding the construction. So we have to cover the, uh, the, the, the tower. The tower is not roofed traditionally with timber, of course, to be uh, more uh, powerful in defending uh, against the enemies. So uh, the structure is made of uh, concrete and uh, this solution makes possible uh, uh, to create, to build the vault quite in a very uh, practical and quite speed way. Now we abandon, yes, I, I'm going very quickly, but <laughs> I want to go to the point. So we have seen uh, the tradition of Rome. We have seen that in the imperial times, there was a, a wide and a, a unique uh, technique in Rome that is to build vaults using mortar and small stones, which in a good construction is made in the system of Roman concrete with very good horizontal layering of the stones, which increases the quality of, of the vault. Uh, while in uh, poorer uh, constructions, in later constructions, as the one we have seen from the uh, early 5th century, we find that here the use is uh, based on a kind of uh, rubble, uh, not very regular construction. But again, the concept is to use mortar and stones to create the vault. Now, we just uh, shift our attention to a completely different context. And we go to the east. Particularly, we go to, uh, to the Peloponnese, 
the Peloponnese is a very interesting uh, case study because uh, just uh, the, uh, the understanding of uh, the vaulting techniques used in Greece uh, makes uh, sense uh, in, uh, to see the process, the how Roman builders react in different contexts. In Rome, the context is to have uh, volcanic material, you have lightweight material, but especially you have pozzolana, which makes possible to create the hydraulic mortar, which is fundamental for Roman concrete. But in the Peloponnese, you don't have that. And so what we see in the Peloponnese is that since early times, let's say Julius Caesar, that is to say first century BC, uh, there is uh, an attention to create vaulting in the Roman way, but not with concrete, but using the bricks. The use uh, for the bricks is very clear. Here you have the centering. You place your bricks radi radially above the centering, and when, once you place the key brick, uh, the, the whole vault uh, acts like a structure which can uh, support any weight. The centering goes away and then, yes, you can create your traditional Roman vault with Roman uh, uh, um, mortar rubble. So this is the solution that we find in uh, in Greece, and this solution uh, is, makes sense because it is the way to create a kind of permanent centering, which is uh, uh, clearly the, the outcome for this is that once you create your brick vault, it is enough strong to support any weight above it, and particularly the the weight of mortar rubble. If you don't have pozzolana, that is to say, if you don't have the chance to use hydraulic mortar, then you uh, have to wait for the, the mortar rubble to harden. And if you don't have uh, pozzolana, this can take a very long time. With this system, you can use a very quick and speed construction, which was one of the aims of in the Roman times. Go very quick, as clearly stated by Vitruvius when he says uh, in the, the Architectura, he says clearly, you know, the good construction is the one made by the Greeks. Uh, they are the good builders. We, the poor Romans, they may, we make very bad construction because our uh, need to speed construction doesn't make us possible to use the traditional stone construction as in Greece. We use mortar, we pour the mortar, and the constructions at the end are not so good. This, of course, was at the time of, let's say, Julius Caesar Augustus, then things developed, and uh, maybe uh, the there was a clear change, at least in Rome, in the quality of construction. Nevertheless, in Greece, they could not afford to use the building techniques for Roman vaulting the same as we have in Rome. For this reason, they developed this system. This is, I'm sorry, it's very clear. This is a mausoleum, mausoleum uh, which is in Patras. The, uh, the mausoleum is dated in, uh, under Augustus. So we have very clearly early in the Roman times in Greece the use of brick vaults. Uh, the system, we have many, many, many examples. It's very interesting to see, to compare. Uh, this is a mausoleum in Troisen. Uh, here you have the very typical brick vault. It's a brick, a solid brick vault. Uh, creates a kind of shell, and then you have the parallel. You have in, uh, in Isola Sacra, you have the, uh, the same uh, architectural layout. Of course, the Greek one is imitating the Roman one, 
but here you have a concrete vault. So, uh, two uh, similar architectural layout, different technical solutions for, uh, uh, for the vaulting. Maybe you can see that this uh, tomb here has a very typical brick facing that you, we could imagine looking at the brick facing that is in Italy. But then we go up and we look to the vault and we clearly understand we are not in Italy, at least in central Italy. Uh, another interesting, very, 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 very interesting example is another uh, tomb that is in uh, Troisen. In this case, our, um, uh, our interest is uh, to the use of a very peculiar uh, building technique f with bricks, to create brick vaults. This is the so-called pitched brick construction, uh, which is a technique that was very common in the Near East, in Mesopotamia, it's quite documented, and for the first time used in Greece at, uh, let's say, under Trajan. Uh, this is a detail of uh, the bricks. This is another uh, brick vault made with the same technique. In this case, we are in a Roman bath in Epidaurus. Epidaurus, the sanctuary of Epidaurus, is 80% Roman, reconstructed under the period of uh, Antoninus Pius. And we have the same solution. So this could be a second century uh, constructions. Uh, the system here, it is very well explained. This is a picture from War Perkins, which shows that uh, the very peculiar uh, uh, building technique for uh, pitch brick balls is that you don't need centering. This is a miracle for construction because the centering is costly, it, uh, it's time consuming, it's a problem for construction. So if we can avoid using a centering, it's uh, much worth for having a very quick and good construction. So this is one of the possible, uh, the drawing uh, is a diagram of uh, one of the possible systems for creating this kind of sailboat. This is also very common in other, uh, with other uh, systems for placing the, the bricks. So, uh, brick vaulting in the East can be summarized in uh, the very traditional barrel vaults. Uh, these barrel vaults are created with uh, uh, with, uh, in uh, some cases, with the centering, but when you use the pitch brick techniques, you can also avoid the centering. Uh, this, uh, the use of uh, bricks and the brick industry expands to Asia Minor in the second century. So it is the time when we start finding brick vaults also in Asia Minor. Uh, this, as we can see, will be fundamental in later times. Here we have a, a two sail bolts, uh, bolts uh, with uh, the pitch brick technique, which is the one uh, as we have seen in the tomb, and the more traditional technique that is the one used for the domes, uh, which is with bricks placed radially. The difference between the two Architecturally speaking, nothing. There is no difference. Uh, speaking about construction, this needs a centering. This doesn't need a centering. So it's, this technique is very good for creating small vaults without centering. Small vaults, we say up to five, six uh, uh, meters span. Uh, so, uh, we have also cases of mixed construction. As we said, up to the level 
of the haunches, we can build our vault without centering, but then, yes, for the last part, we need the centering. So it's quite often, it's common to find that the centering is placed only in the upper part of the brick vault. Uh, so from this, we can now move uh, to the brick vaulting in Byzantium, and of course, Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia is brick, brick vaulting, not concrete vaulting. So it's clearly the apotheosis of bricks, and not only of architecture in the Byzantine period. So we have the very big dome made with radially laid bricks with centering, but also we have, uh, now we will see, in, uh, in the smaller, uh, as in the narthex vaults, they have uh, the system made with the pitch brick techniques without centering. This technique is documented. There is a very interesting study made uh, by Professor Caridis uh, on the churches, vaulted churches uh, in Asia Minor. Uh, between the 5th and 6th century, which is enlightening for the understanding of how these building techniques moved and developed uh, from the 2nd century AD up to the 5th century, that is to say, from Roman to Byzantine architecture. And here there is just one case. He is uh, a very good scholar and he explains everything in very detail. Uh, you can see clearly they use the wide use of bricks for the, the supporting masonries, but also for creating very uh, uh, domed construction for the aims of uh, uh, fifth and sixth century uh, Byzantine architecture. Uh, here we are in Santirene in uh, Istanbul. We see the pitch brick technique, very clear here. This is uh, from George uh, uh, book on uh, Santirene, in, uh, which is uh, incredibly is built in the tradition of uh, the historians, architectural historians of early 1900s, with very deep understanding of the construction process and very beautiful drawings. Uh, and this is taken from War Pekins, his uh, publication on uh, the Byzantine Palace of Istanbul. And here again we see the pitch brick technique, bricks, 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 bricks everywhere. Now, as uh, I said in my start, starting uh, my paper, there is one case that was uh, clearly uh, uh, highlighted in uh, Luco Scozza work, which is uh, the brick tower in, uh, in uh, the brick vault in uh, tower J17. Uh, this is the intrados. This is clearly a Byzantine vault, or at least they'd say it is an Eastern vault. Uh, this shows the parts that we are going to see that in detail. Uh, we, we show the, the part that is made with brick vaulting. We compare the traditional Honorian uh, tower, we ha which has the traditional barrel vault made with uh, rubble masonry. And here, uh, this was the form, something happened, and uh, this vault was replaced with a cross vault, it is a cross vault, made entirely with bricks. If we look up to the intrados, this is a drawing of the intrados, and uh, we can detect the work that has been done by the masons to insert this brick vault in the existing structure of the Honorian Tower. What we see here in this detail, we have, first of all, uh, uh, 
we have the brick vault here. Here we have the imprint of a marble uh, block placed here. Underneath that, in this sector, the remains show that the bricks were placed horizontally and were supported by this uh, calcareous block placed here, corbelling from the wall. The reason for this is very clear that with this building technique, it's very hard to go to the impost, especially when you, don't, when you are working with an existing masonry. So you have to insert something inside an existing uh, construction. For this reason, it's much easier to create horizontal layers up to here. And from this point of view, yes, here, they decide that it's much better to use the pitched brick technique. Of course, the reason for the bridge brick technique is that they don't want to use the centering. Uh, okay, and then looking at this detail, here we have the junction with the Honorian barrel vault covering the staircase, this one. They have to, con they have, uh, this maybe was broken and they have to supplement the missing part. And here again, they try to insert. They have to insert, there is a uh, flat arch, which is that one, which is here, which separates the brick vault from the concrete one. To place this flat arch, they have to place a slab, a uh, marble slab here to support this, and then uh, this uh, marble slab cuts the existing Honorian arch, goes inside, and then here we have the support of the slab. So it's very clear. These masons are working on something existing, and they decide, they decide to use the technique of uh, brick vaulting without centering. When and who? These are <laughs> the main uh, uh, question marks uh, uh, that we, uh, we just wonder. This is so different. This is unique. There is only one other case uh, which is uh, more difficult to understand is half vault uh, made with the pitch brick technique uh, in a, an adjacent sector of the Aurelianic walls. But however, there is not so clear the understanding of the insertion of the new vault inside the existing tower. So here, this is a case study very interesting because we understand that uh, they had to place a brick vault into an existing tower. And they decided that this is the ideal solution, not the very common building technique used widely and extensively in Rome, which is Roman concrete. No, brick vaults. The detail at the crown of the vault is enlightening. You see here there is a kind of very special partner. It creates a kind of cross, but it's interesting to see how the masons, this uh, is like the painters, they, uh, they paint uh, an eye or uh, an ear, in a, every painter has his own way to paint. There are masons who put their signature when they, they, they create uh, 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 a masonry. Uh, because they like a detail or they think that is more functional, whatever. They have, they sign their balls. And I was uh, surprised to go very, very far in the east and go to Zenobia, in, uh, and, uh, which has an amazing uh, fortification all made with stone. Uh, it's local stone. Uh, we are on the river Euphrates, and here everything is stone. Uh, we have a very nice stone construction, which is uh, the Praetorium, and the Praetorium has very beautiful arches that uh, it was a three-story building, 
arches which connect uh, the, and create the rooms. But the vaults between the arches are made of pitch brick technique. And uh, the detail at the crown is exactly similar to this. So Zenobia is made uh, uh, before this, the Praetorium is dated before the Persian walls made by Justinian. So uh, we are talking a period that is before 1550. Uh, no, sorry, 550. Uh, we are not in the Renaissance yet. However, in the Renaissance, there are a lot of brick vaults in Italy. Um, so uh, the conclusions of all this. Uh, for me, uh, it is uh, very clear that in both sides, you, have, you are using uh, brick uh, vaulting, but inserted in a context where everything is not uh, related to brick vaulting, in, uh, meaning that in Zenobia, you have, uh, uh, you have the stone construction, which is entirely covering all the building process, except from the vaults. And in the Aurelianic walls, what do you have? You have an existing tower, and you have to insert a vault. Uh, second, uh, both the constructions, they are using the pitched brick technique, which is the one which makes possible not to use the centering, that is to say, to have a speeder construction. Uh, so, as we said, uh, the, uh, the supports and the details of the crown are so similar. So, the, well, my idea is that here we have clearly some specialized uh, masons which in the period of Justinian, which very well described by Procopius in the Edificis, they are just renovating, strengthening, working for the fortifications of the empire. And in some cases, they are very expert. They come from Constantinople, where they are skilled in construction of pitch brick technique. And they are a group of masons who go and uh, do uh, very special work, just vaulting with bricks. So this is what I am proposing you for tonight. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>